great introduction. Uh, I want to make one correction. Uh, I often have told people that I got into decoding DNA because my newborn and, and my newborn son uh, 15 years ago was rushed to the newborn intensive care uh, unit at Yale. He wasn't breathing, and I wanted to uh, understand why he, he wasn't breathing, and I wanted to understand his genome. But uh, it turns out that wasn't uh, the original motivation for getting into DNA sequencing. It was my motivation to get back into it. My original motivation actually came from the Peabody Museum. And when I was a, a child, I would uh, go into the Hall of Dinosaurs with the famous mural. I was most interested in Tyrannosaurus rex, but there was a wonderful brontosaurus there also. And uh, long before uh, Robert Crichton did his uh, Jurassic Park, I had wanted to bring back dinosaurs. I have witnesses to this effect, which are my nephews and nieces, and I had uh, dreamed and dreamed about uh, bringing back di dinosaurs. And uh, today, uh, I might talk about things that start to make that maybe uh, more, more than a dream. So uh, I have a fancy title, but I'm mostly going to talk at first about DNA sequencing and, and technology, and I promise I'll go back to the dinosaurs and, and, uh, and my son. Uh, so I just wanted to give people a feel of where DNA uh, sequencing is now. I can tell you where it was in the uh, mid to late 1980s because I was sequencing DNA in Klein Biology Tower and I took six years and during those six years I decoded 9,000 bases of DNA. To give you a little perspective, uh, our genome is about three billion in a haploid or uh, six billion if you count uh, both your mom and your dad. And so I was able to decode 9,000 bases in six years, and I thought that was good. I was working for Spiros Artivanis in the biology department, and uh, a colleague of, of mine who was a year ahead, Tian Shu, who's now chairman, I'm sorry, vice chairman of human genetics at Yale now, uh, went to my advisor and said he didn't think anybody should graduate until they sequenced 40,000 bases, because that's what he had sequenced for his gene. So uh, that was the state of the art. Six years, a lot, lot of all-nighters, uh, 9,000 bases. Uh, two summers ago, uh, there was a, a strain of uh, E. coli was uh, killing people in Germany. Uh, over 700 people were rushed to the uh, emergency rooms. Uh, over 50 of those people uh, died, and it was from uh, a strain of e, e. coli that they had gotten from, from some unknown source. And uh, scientists using a machine we had developed were able to decode that genome uh, in two hours. And that genome was five million letters long, not 9,000, five million. And in fact, they had sequenced it 100-fold. They had sequenced 500 million bases. They had done it in two hours, and that allowed them to assemble the entire genome of this microorganism. They put it on the internet. A postdoc in Australia uh, annotated uh, the assembled genome that night, identified uh, genes that showed it was resistant to 14 classes of antibiotic, a true superbug. Uh, for those of you who fo follow the use of antibiotics in agriculture in Europe, you know it's, quote, been banned. But those of you who have done any environmental work know that a bacteria isn't going to carry resistance to 14 strains of uh, antibiotic uh, for no reason. So it was obviously ha had been s somehow subjected to huge numbers of antibiotics. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a superbug. The decoding of the genome allowed a few things. It allowed them to understand its resistance and it allowed them to make a diagnostic, a $1 DNA probe uh, that could be circulated around the world so in the future people could identify this particularly virulent strain of bacteria in a, in a food source or if it got into the population. And I was going to spend the uh, rest of the time talking about dinosaurs and how we got to the point 
that we could understand something that was killing somebody by decoding its genome. How did we get to the point that in two hours you could decode a genome that's five million uh, bases long? And uh, I use this to remind me to tell you guys that. So how did it start? It, it started with uh, Frederick Sanger uh, and uh, Wally Gilbert, who both de developed methods in the late 1970s to break down small stretches of DNA, usually a, a few hundred uh, bases or a few hundred letters, and uh, de decode their linear order. And the ability to do that really gave rise to whole industries. It allowed, along with recombinant DNA, the ability to snip these things and put them together and express those genes, allowed us to, to create a whole industry, the biotech industry, allowed us to take a gene for insulin, a human growth hormone, move it into a bacteria, and produce as much as we wanted. So we had recombinant DNA and we had the ability to decode it, and that gave us that entire biotechnology industry. About a decade later, uh, Lloyd Smith in Lee Hood's lab realized that that basic method, known as the Sanger method of decoding DNA, could be automated, and you could remove the uh, radioactive labels and replace them with fluorescent labels to make it uh, uh, safer, and you could scale it up. And that became the uh, basis for the proposed Human Genome Project, where they would take these machines and the automation and uh, two groups, one a consortium of scientists around the world, publicly funded, and one uh, uh, Craig Venter's group, privately funded, uh, decided to decode the human genome. The uh, public effort took about uh, $3 billion of resources, and a lot of that resources uh, were involved in actually taking the human genome, breaking it into small pieces, 100 to 500 each, and putting each one in a separate plasmid, and a separate bacteria so you could independently grow up these pieces of DNA. And uh, about a third of the money was used to decode it. Uh, the private one was a little bit more efficient, but it used a lot of the information and a lot of the physical clones uh, and information from the public effort. But it was a 10-year effort, $3 billion, and what we ended up with was not an individual's genome, but a consensus genome that told us what it was like to be a modern man, moder modern homo sapien. And uh, this was a, a tremendous effort, but again, it gave us a map of, of, of not any individual, but if you will, of all of us. It was literally mixtures uh, of people. And it led to a, a lot of misconceptions. There was a lot of headlines that says, said we're all the same. Well, we were all the same because they put it together in a computer and, and made one map from all of them. Uh, but it led to a, a lot of misconceptions. But uh, as I mentioned, when my son was born in, in 1999, and, and, and uh, this is Noah, he was rushed to the newborn intensive care, and he was having difficulty breathing. And I realized at that moment, and it was a moment where I thought I was on top of the world, I was CEO of a public company, we were mining that human genome to make drugs, I had been studying that consensus uh, genome. I realized at that moment I wasn't interested in the genome of all of us. I really wanted to know my son's genome. And for, for me, that was the start of my interest in personal medicine or preci precision medicine now, as, as it's called. Uh, but more specifically, it brought back uh, my interest in, in decoding uh, uh, DNA on a big scale. And I did it the only way I know how to do things, which is I, I bring together the smartest people I can convince, so that means really smart people that uh, probably jump before they should, and uh, put them all together and started the company, and said, we're going to make a machine that allows anybody to decode not genes, thousands of bases, uh, but genomes, and uh, put together a group of people, and we were able to build a technology that allowed for the first time uh, small groups or individual resources to decode uh, entire genomes. And I, I won't go through the technology, but it was based on uh, two major advances. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, 
Uh, a lot of money had been spent breaking up the human genome, taking each piece, putting it into a plasma, putting the plasma into a bacteria, and growing in little separate dishes 600 million or a billion separate fragments to cover the human genome many times. And our first advance was, let's skip all that. Let's just break up the DNA and dilute it until any given little piece of uh, volume of water only has one molecule. And then we'd encapsulate that, in, in our case, in an emulsion, or you could put it down on glass and it would be separated that way. So you'd get rid of the upstream prep, which took years, and that allowed us to prepare DNA in hours instead of either, instead of years, literally, for a genome. And then instead of sequencing by Sanger sequencing, we decided to do it in a different way. At the time, the gold standard, as I mentioned, was Sanger sequencing. And there was a lot of efforts to miniaturize Sanger sequencing, but they had been unsuccessful. And I thought, instead of trying to miniaturize the gold standard, let's try to take some other method that might be considered inferior, but is uh, easily miniaturizable. And I chose a method that was based on something known as uh, pyrosequencing. And pyrosequencing hadn't actually been used to sequence or decode DNA de novo, but it had been used to determine single nucleotide polymorphisms, a single place in the DNA and probe it and say is an A, C, G, or T. But the re thing I liked about that method is it didn't require any mechanical separation, and you could sequence DNA by synthesis, and you could monitor that synthesis with a camera, and you'd be able to do it in parallel. So instead of sequencing mechanically by breaking DNA into pieces on a giant gel for hours, we would sequence little pieces, maybe only 100 bases long, but we would do millions of them in parallel. And these two concepts became the basis of both my company, which was the first company to sell a machine uh, to do high throughput or next-gen sequencing, but also of the industry. Uh, a lot of people came to market uh, with these two ideas. And when you have something new, you usually get two responses. Uh, the response that I like, this is going to be big, or the negative response. Uh, which is, you know, it will never scale. Sure, they could decode a virus. So we decoded something that was 34,000 letters long. It was an adenovirus. And so uh, Richard Gibbs said it was going to be big, and Edward Rubin said, you know, you could never do bacteria or bigger things. Uh, so what I did is I avoided this person and put this guy on my scientific advisory board. <laughs> uh, the good news is that it worked. And we were able to make machines, ship them around the world, and people did amazing things with them. What I'm going to talk about for, uh, for the next section of the talk is some of the projects that my team was involved in. Uh, but as you can see, people did things that we didn't necessarily uh, anticipate. Uh, and on the end of the day, people have been using it to heal the world, fuel the world, feed the world, and secure the world. And I'll give you some of the examples that, that I was involved in. And each of these examples, I'm going to give a, a little life lesson, I think, or at least a lesson that I, that I took home. So one of the first projects that we published was understanding a drug uh, for tuberculosis. For those of you who know drug development, it's easier to develop a drug when you know what protein in the human body or in the microorganism you're targeting the drug is binding to, because then chemists can take a rational approach and improve the drug. So J&J uh, &J had the first new class of compounds to treat uh, tuberculosis in 40 years. But before they could bring it to market, they wanted to understand where in the tuberculosis genome was this drug targeting. And so they sent us uh, a number of strains of tuberculosis, some that were sensitive to the drug and some that were resistant. And at the time, this was a, a novel approach. We actually, to determine the drug target, decided to sequence the entire genome. And again, at the time, people were still, uh, like I was, struggling graduate students spending a few years doing a few hundred bases. People had done a hu uh, whole genome, but they had spent 100 million on it. So it wouldn't be practical to do you know, three of them at 300 million. But with our new technology, we said we can do it on the order of thousands of dollars. 
So we sequenced these three strains. We actually had to develop most of the software ourselves because there wasn't software to put together uh, genomes readily available. And then we analyzed those genomes. And what we found was there was one gene that had a mutation that conferred resistance to the drug. And that gene coded for the protein target of the drug. So J and J could move forward. They understood how their drug worked. Uh, J and J got a great publication. And I got a lesson. My lesson was that the team at 454 that had invented the machine had sequenced all three genomes, had put it together, had done the analysis, wasn't anywhere on the paper. But when I mentioned that, they said, don't panic, because if you look at reference uh, 15, it is an acknowledgment uh, that we did the work. So uh, this is a, a, another uh, a fun story. One of my jobs after uh, putting together a team is uh, to evangelize the technology. And the best way to do that is to find people that have the most exciting projects, work with them, and, and publish. Pretty straightforward. So this is a case where an amazing scientist, Matthew Meyerson, uh, at Harvard, had just shown that uh, an important drug, ERISA, would work in some people and not others for exactly the reason uh, that that tuberculosis worked, drug worked and didn't work. The target sometimes was mutated, and if the target was resistant, then the drug wouldn't work. Pretty simple, pretty powerful. You could now do a clinical trial where you'd give your drug just to the people that would respond and not give it to the non-responders. I thought this would change the entire pharmaceutical industry in 2006. I immediately called Matthew Meyerson and said, hey, I, I want to do some of this kind of work. Let's go into humans. Let's sequence. Let's understand who will respond to a drug, who won't respond to a drug. And I told him, he must be changing the whole pharmaceutical industry. That was my next lesson. He said, nope, none of them are paying any attention. Uh, they get promoted when they send a drug to trial. Uh, they're sure not going to, you know, start selecting patients at that point. That was 2006. Anyhow, uh, they didn't believe in it, but I thought this was pretty amazing stuff. And uh, Matthew uh, had a patient uh, that was not responding to a cancer drug. And he said, instead of doing whole genomes like I talked about in that bacterial case, let's study the same gene, but over and over and over again. So we basically study it in a population of cells that make up that tumor. Because cancer is the disease of the genome. Each one of those cells in the cancer is actually slightly different. And let's understand that and see if we can give the right medicine to the right person by instead of sequencing the cancer genome, sequencing a few genes we care about millions of times and seeing if there's any cells within that cancer that are resistant to your drug because we know those cells will then grow up and take over. And so we did this project where we did what is now known as deep sequencing and uh, not only did it work, uh, Matthew sequenced or sent us the samples, we, we sequenced, we found a mutation, we told Matthew that the person had this mutation in their uh, tumor. Uh, Matthew then switched them to a drug that didn't uh, target this. Uh, the patient responded. I ran back to work, told everybody, look, we're, we're, we're saving lives. Uh, my lawyers immediately put an insert in every machine we sold that says, not for human use, uh, because we hadn't gone to the FDA and got approval for that. Uh, the good news is, uh, for the last 10 years, doctors have a right to take a research use only technology like DNA sequencing. Companies can't promote it for this, but they can read publications and use it for their patients. And if you go into any major tertiary care center, uh, and if you know somebody unfortunately has a cancer, they'll usually sequence 200 to 400 genes in deep sequencing to determine which medicines they should get and not get. And my favorite emails are still emails I receive from doctors that say, we sequenced the patient's cancer, we changed the medicine, they responded, and I immediately send those to my mom. <laughs> uh, I'll do this quickly. This is another uh, collaboration with a, a Yale uh, researcher. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, at the time, people knew that 25% of the people that are newly infected with HIV in uh, San Francisco were already resistant to many of the common drugs, 
And unfortunately, there was no way at the time with Sanger sequencing where you take some blood and sequence it to see if they had a mutation that, was ris that gave, would give them resistance to a drug. You couldn't see it because in order for you to see something if you sequence like that, the resistant virus has to be at least 35% of the population. By the time you have a strain of HIV that's 35% resistant to a, to a drug, you've destroyed the patient's immune system. So if you wait that long, uh, the patient's not going to live very long. But if you could see it early and you could change the therapy or give the right combination uh, uh, of therapies, you could uh, change their lives. And we were able to show that you could see one part in a million or one part in 100,000 and know that that patient shouldn't get uh, that specific drug or drug cocktail. And as we know, uh, through, through diagnostics and through combination therapy, uh, now HIV is, is becoming a, a chronic disease as opposed to a, a death sentence. So uh, we've talked about an, an, a number of, of really fun projects we've done, but this is probably the most important because this is the project that got my machine in a movie. Uh, Ian Lipkin is a great researcher, and uh, he was a consultant to Contagion. And Ian had a very interesting problem. There was a number of patients that had all received organs from the same donor, and three of these patients dropped dead, and they didn't know why. And so uh, Ian is a, a detective. He sent us samples from these three patients, and we just started to sequence randomly from these samples. Everything, uh, nuclear DNA, uh, anything, any DNA uh, that we could find. And we literally just made a database uh, of this, and then we looked for things that aren't in uh, a, a control group. And what we found was a normally very benign uh, virus. But it turns out uh, that transplant patients, of course, are immune suppressed. And in the background of this immunosuppressive drug, this normally uh, uh, ben benign uh, virus uh, kills the patient. And so we were able to, to solve this. And uh, the New England Journal of Medicine called this the new age of, of molecular diagnostic. Uh, but per, for me, there was a reminder that many of these things aren't, if, if you will, uh, heredity uh, uh, versus environment. They're both. And uh, with that lesson, we were doing another project, uh, again with, with Ian. And in this case, researchers from around the United States has, had sent him uh, materials collected from hives, beehives. Uh, there's a worldwide crisis that bees are just dying, and, and people uh, didn't know why at the time, and uh, I won't take the punchline yet, but uh, bees were just dying, and their colonies were collapsing, and of course, bees are such an important part uh, of the ecosystem. So in this case, they just sent us literally material from these hives. We extracted nucleic acids. Again, this could be from the bees. It could be uh, from the plants that the bees brought back. Uh, we didn't know what was in there. But we did just randomly sequence from hives that had collapsed to and from hives uh, that were healthy. And uh, sure enough, uh, they found a, a, a virus. Uh, but even though you could take that virus, and infect a colony and cause it to collapse, I wouldn't say that's the cause of uh, the honeybee disappearance. Because as we learned from the immune suppressant patient, and as we all know often from our own experiments, there's a combination. What's happening in the environment that now is making these colonies su susceptible? Because uh, maybe they were fine a, a decade ago with those uh, same viruses. So there's something else happening besides uh, this virus. Why are these bees now susceptible, I, I, I think, is the second half uh, of this uh, 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 equation. Because at the time when we published it, everybody was, OK, now we understand why these hives collapse. And I was a little bit anxious because 
No, we know with whatever's happening to these hives, this happens to be able to contribute uh, to their collapse. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. All right, uh, let's get back to the Peabody Museum. So again, uh, I'm cold calling people. I, I find people that I think have done the best work. I call them, I say, hey, we have the first way to sequence lots and lots of DNA inexpensively. Let's do you know, a really good experiment. And one of the people I was put in contact with is uh, Svante Pavo. And uh, I had never met him. I'm on the phone with him. And I truly said to him, I want to sequence a dinosaur. And he didn't hang up the phone. It, it turns out he's an amazing guy. That's like the acid test for amazing people. If you call them, cold call them, and say, let's sequence a dinosaur, and they don't hang up. And uh, while he didn't hang up, he said, Jonathan, you can't do that. And I said, why not? I read science, I read nature. I read a paper that somebody took amber, sound like a movie plot, broke it open, and sequenced DNA that was 28 million years old. Sure, dinosaurs died out 65 million, but you know, close enough for an engineer. Uh, and he said, no, that's not reproducible. And I was just aghast. I said, what are you talking about? It was published in like science or nature. It has to be true. Uh, the lesson was, he told me, just because it's published in ni nature and science, and this might be a shock to some of you, it doesn't have to be true. No one's ever been able to reduce, uh, reproduce the uh, amber 28 uh, million year old DNA. Uh, at that point, I didn't hang up, you know, because I was super disappointed. Uh, again, it had been a multi-decade quest to, to sequence these dinosaurs. I didn't hang up, and uh, I said, send me the next best thing. Next best thing to Tyrannosaurus rex, as most of you know, is Neanderthal, right? So I said, send that, and he still didn't hang up because I didn't realize that to have a few micrograms of Neanderthal DNA, uh, people had spent their whole careers. In fact, we had authors on our first paper who were literally dead. They had passed away, but they had contributed, uh, you know, important pe uh, pieces of DNA to this puzzle. And so he said, no, that's the most precious DNA on Earth. I'm not sending it to you. Uh, but, again, didn't hang up. He said, I have stakes, almost, of uh, cave bear. Like mammoth, you can actually get pounds of cave bear meat. And cave bear is also about uh, 35,000 years old, about the same time as the Neanderthal uh, uh, went extinct. And he said, that would prove that we could do ancient DNA. So I'll sell, send you cave bear. So he sent it to us. And uh, Mike McKenna is actually here today, and Mike and other people who are at 454. Uh, the day we sequenced it, it was one of those rare times where an experiment actually works first time. The day we threw it on the machine, we had more ancient DNA at that moment than had ever been decoded uh, cumulatively in, in history. Uh, we called Svante, he got on a plane, uh, uh, flew to Bramford, and he said, now we can do Neanderthal. Perfect timing, it turns out. It was the 150th anniversary of the find of uh, Neanderthal in the Neanderthal Valley. And so uh, Svante was able to go to the Max Planck Society and get five million bucks, five million euro, send it to us, and we started to sequence and uh, started to decode uh, Neanderthal. And it's been an a, a amazing journey. Obviously, there's been a lot of publications since, and we're, we're learning a lot. Uh, I'll tell you uh, some of my interests in, in this project. Uh, along with wanting to make dinosaurs, I've always been interested in, in what differentiates uh, modern man uh, from all the primates before us. You know, why, why are we able to, uh, you know, make laser pointers and, and microprocessors? And uh, Svante says it very elegantly. He says, uh, Neanderthal never crossed a body of water that they didn't see the other side. When man came out of Africa, you know, next thing we knew we were on Easter Island. There wasn't anything we didn't explore. So some fundamental uh, uh, differences. And by comparing the genomes, of modern man with uh, Neanderthal man and now Devisonian, you can start finding 
the genes and changes in genes that, that differentiates us. And the amazing thing is it's about 200. And some number of those scientists are working out are going to be involved in the development of the nervous system and uh, maybe give us either the courage or the ability to imagine what it's like to cross that uh, body of water. And so I, I do think we're really going to get insight into something as special as cognition uh, from uh, the doing these uh, genomes. Uh, again, though, there was a lesson. We thought this was pretty cool. And uh, there was a Nicholas Wade uh, write-up in the New York Times, which started off pretty cool. Uh, it was cool enough that my sister says, I finally know what you're doing uh, because you're doing the, you know, Neanderthal that's in the museum. Uh, so she understood it. But reading through the article, by the time I was at the bottom, it had digressed to the point that they were discussing bringing back Neanderthal by putting back the mutations in embryos and implanting it. It's like, oh my God, how did they get there? Uh, so uh, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So we were decoding it, and other people, pretty smart people that I admire a lot, like George Church, were saying, hey, you know, we can bring these things back. You probably, I don't think, can ethically bring back Neanderthal. However, uh, this is a, a, a group uh, from uh, uh, UPenn that decoded uh, the mammoth genome. And uh, when it first came out, I felt bad that we had got scooped. We had nothing to do with this project. But then I saw this picture, and they decoded it with my machine, so I felt a little bit better. <laughs> uh, but this was actually pretty interesting. Uh, if you look at the mammoth, first of all, it turns out, you know, all furry things look the same to me, so all mammoths were the same in, in my mind. But it turns out there were two types of mammoths, uh, very uh, gen genetically uh, separated and probably five million years separated from uh, uh, elephants. And for those of us who are uh, homo sapiens, we think of five million years of evolution as a lot, because that's like us in a bonobo or something or a chimpanzee. Uh, but it, it, it turns out that these guys take evolution a lot slower. And uh, there was probably two classes uh, of mammoth. Well, I just call them big furry things. There was two of them. And it actually ended up solving some, some interesting uh, mysteries. So I can tell you that in at least one case, one of these groups of mammoths died out about uh, 50,000 years ago. So we didn't kill them. Phew, you know, that's great. But the other grew out, died out about 10,000 years ago. So that one's a little bit suspicious, uh, you know, as we came over the land bridge. So uh, we didn't kill at least one of them. So that was the good news. And uh, as you know, as people are, are studying Neanderthal genomes, uh, all of us carry, all, all of us who uh, migrated out of Africa uh, 50, 75,000 years ago carry about 3% of Neanderthal. Uh, but the interesting thing is if we sequenced everybody in this room, we could probably reconstruct about 50% of Neanderthal. We don't carry the same uh, 3%. There are some things in, in common. Uh, one of the things pretty obvious or maybe would have been obvious to look at is there are genes that are involved in adoption to, to living in the cold uh, that we do share in common, all, all from Neanderthal. Uh, but otherwise, there's a, a, a lot of tricks that we each uh, individually have uh, uh, from uh, the Neanderthal. So a, a lot of uh, interesting things can be learned uh, from comparing uh, the, these different genomes. So I like completing projects. As, as I mentioned, I, I started this company uh, to make DNA inexpensive because I wanted to sequence my son. The good news is uh, Noah recovered. It appears that his was not genetic. It was environmental. Uh, we suspect, but we can't prove, uh, that the epidural that my wife had uh, somehow ended up uh, paralyzing uh, his respiratory system at, at some level. Uh, but I like finishing projects, and we needed to sequence an individual genome, and we thought the best person to do would be uh, Watson. Uh, we'd get in trouble if we exhumed uh, Francis Crick. So I went to visit Watson, and he, he volunteered. He gave us his, his blood. Uh, we, we sequenced it. And at that moment, it was the first decoded 
individual genome or personal genome. Uh, however, it took us a year to publish it, and this was a, another little lesson. We sent the publication in, you know, pretty cocky. We just sequenced, you know, Jim Watson. The reviews came back pretty good on the scientific side, and, and then they said we can't publish it uh, because it's not ethical. I was like, time out. I just spent, you know, the last couple of years working on this. Uh, but uh, for those of you who have seen uh, Annie Hall, uh, do you remember that scene where uh, Woody Allen is hearing an argument about some book and he thinks the guy's an idiot and the guy says, oh, I'm from professor from Columbia, I can't be an idiot. So he brings Marshall McLaurin off the side and Marshall McLaurin says, no, you're a complete idiot. And then he goes away and Woody Allen goes, uh, see, don't you guys wish you could do that in real life? Well, so to get this published, uh, we got Amy McGuire, who is my Marshall McLaurin, an ethicist, and she wrote this incredible response to Nature. And then Nature says, oh, amazing, and published the response as a separate page right with our paper. I will confess to this day I don't understand her arguments, but it got us published. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's good news. Again, a little bit of lessons. Think you're on top of the world. Things are going well. Uh, but I guess a little bit like Steve Jobs, I learned uh, you can actually lose a company. And I woke up, and it turns out that my beautiful company, 454, which had invented a field, we had over 100 million sales our first year. Things were going great. It turns out it was now owned by Hoffman LaRoche, and I was out of a job. Uh, so uh, how do you tell that to, to your son? or any of your kids. I got five of them now, I had three at the time. Uh, so, so I didn't. Uh, but I had told Noah, and this is an older picture of Noah, that we had just read the genome of uh, Jim Watson. And he listened, and then I told him a little bit about the mammoth genome. But he thought it would be a, a lot more useful, and he envisioned himself being in a room like this, but in the room is Bill Gates. And instead of reading Bill's genome, he thought it would be much more lucrative to read his mind. And so he said, why don't you develop a machine that would like read minds? You know, forget reading this genome stuff. No, I was always looking for an angle. Uh, I didn't tell him because I was out of work. I could kind of spend time doing anything I want. And so uh, I actually thought about it and uh, realized that uh, if I was going to go do something, you know, I'd have to catch up. And I wanted to leverage the power of semiconductors. We had taken a lot of the ideas of semiconductors when we had built 454. The whole idea of doing everything on a single substrate, in the electronic industry, that's known as the monolithic idea. And, and that's what Noyce and Kilby did at Intel and Texas Instrument when they moved transistors to a single substrate and transistors were the inferior technology, the superior was vacuum tube. So it was analogous to what we did, but we made everything ourselves. We didn't use the same factories that made your modern electronics. And, and so uh, I wanted to make a chip that would leverage all of the things the electronic industry leverage, all these giant factories, the $3 trillion that have gone into that. Uh, but I wanted to make a chip that instead of computing or seeing photons, would literally see chemistry, and then I could use it to do what my son wanted, read minds. And I talked to a really good friend of mine who was also in the Artivanis lab, overlapping with me, who's now a chairman of neurosurgery, Mar Marat Gunnell. And I said, we could make a chip, and you could implant it into minds, and you could see it blink. Uh, but after making the chip, and, and we, di we did build such a chip, uh, I realized it was probably easier to do something I knew about and, and that was read the chemistry that's happening during DNA sequencing. And we were able to make uh, a very inexpensive DNA sequencer. Again, one of the things that's happened in DNA sequencing is we went from those first genomes that cost a billion to three billion to the Watson genome that cost a, a, a few hundred thousand. We had to say a few million when people asked us because we wanted to have margins when we were selling things. And it ran on a machine that cost about a half a million to buy. Uh, but what we were able to do with this chip is we now could make a machine that would cost 50000 or we could sell for 50000 
And as I mentioned, when they decoded that bacteria that was killing people in Germany, they did it on a $99 chip. So that's what semiconductors allowed us to do. It allowed us to go from this half a million dollar machine to a $50,000 machine, from a $1,000 experiment to a $100 experiment. And then it allowed us to do one other thing, which is continue to leverage Moore's law to make things cheaper and cheaper as they got denser and denser. And in the same way that we introduced next-gen sequencing by publishing the Watson genome, we decided to introduce sequencing on a semiconductor by sequencing the genome of Gordon Moore, who's the namesake of Moore's law. Every two years, your computer is twice as powerful uh, for half as much. He's also the founder of Intel, and he's an amazingly wonderful person. And so uh, he gave us uh, his DNA, and uh, we sequenced his genome. And it turns out this was also the first genome that didn't use any light, so no fluorescence and no uh, uh, radiation or electromagnetic radiation. So it was the first uh, post-light uh, genome. And we decided to publish a whole human genome so we wouldn't have Andy Rubin coming to us and saying it wouldn't scale. We would go right to a, a big genome. And uh, since then, we've shown it scaled. So when we introduced 454 technology, I used to say we could sequence four strands of DNA on the space that would fit on the end of one of your hairs. When we introduced uh, the, the first ion machine, I'd tell people you could now sequence 400 pieces of DNA in that same end of your human hair. And what we've done uh, is now launch chips that sequence at densities of 14,000 on the end of the human hair. But the most interesting thing between this point and this point is this machine was actually made in a factory that was originally built in the 1990s. And this machine was made in a factory, or this chip was made in a factory that was built about a decade later. If you think about any computer that you had and those chips in the computer and the difference in performance in that decade, it's about a thousandfold. It turns out a thousandfold is a magic number because the difference between decoding that E. coli genome that was killing people in Germany, which is five million letters, and decoding any of your genome, which are about 6,000 letters, I'm sorry, six billion letters, is a thousandfold. So if you take a chip and build a chip to sequence here, for a hundred bucks, you can sequence a five million letter genome, and because you've got to have good margins, we can now do $1,000 genomes. And uh, recently, well, we did the genome of Charles Towns. He actually passed away, I believe, last Friday. Charles Towns is the guy that gave us uh, lasers. And the, the reason we, we did that is, uh, and I'll do my acknowledgments at the same time, is uh, my uh, niece was at Burning Man. Raise your hand if you know Burning Man. Okay, that's where all these guys go have fun in the desert. And they needed a project. And so we decided to take a genome, and we had already sequenced an individual genome. We had already sequenced the genome on a chip. So we decided to do the first genome that we would beam to another uh, galaxy. And so we thought the right one to beam would be uh, Charles Towns' genome. And uh, he supplied us uh, his DNA. We decoded it for a thousand bucks. And then we sent it by laser pulses uh, to a planet 25,000 light years from here. So if we're ever invaded, this is what they're going to look like. <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody who's helped me uh, on my adventures, build these companies. I am very lucky. I surround myself uh, with people that aren't only smart, but that you want to run into work and, and share your ideas with and share the, uh, the journey and the adventure. Many of them, or some of them, are here today. I will do a plug. Uh, historically, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I think this is too amazing a period of time to be a serial entrepreneur. Uh, so I, I created an incubator, uh, which creates companies, and we have uh, four going now. All of them uh, have the same strategy. We want to have an impact on society, and an impact as large as we can. We, we feel that 
for us, when we want to go to want to go into work, we want that impact in healthcare. And more specifically, we want it to be developing a technology that someday can help the life uh, of somebody uh, we love. So uh, uh, some of those team members are, are here, and we are looking for people that are enthusiastic and don't know better and uh, would like to join us on our adventures. Thanks. Thank you.